I am now delighted to introduce our third speaker, Skyla Reese. Skyla is an undergraduate student at Harvard University. One of her interests is to study sustainable agricultural practices and the ways in which food plays a role in social justice movements. At Harvard, she's a food literacy program fellow, and in this role, she supports initiatives that help students make informed decisions about what they eat. Take it away, Skyla. Hello, everyone. I'm Skyla Reese, and I'm a rising senior at Harvard College, where I study integrative biology. I am so excited to be speaking with you at this virtual summer solstice celebration about oyster aquaculture. When I used to think about the summer, I thought of school being done and I thought of popsicles, but now my mind goes elsewhere. I want you all to close your eyes. Now picture a farm. Do you see a red barn? A cow? Maybe fields of grass? Now did anyone picture the ocean? Although the ocean is not the first thing to come to people's minds when they think of farms, farming in the sea has deep historical roots in Massachusetts, my home state, and that's how I have spent my last few summers. Ocean farming began with indigenous communities trapping fish in small ponds hundreds of years ago, and it has continued ever since. In 1867, this practice of farming the ocean was given its current name, aquaculture. Aquaculture is a very broad term, and it can look like many different things. It may look like fish in fenced-in areas. It may look like seaweed attached to the ocean floor. Or it may look like the type of aquaculture I will speak about today. Oysters hanging from the surface in vertical nets. Despite growing up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where shellfishing drives our economy, I did not try my first oyster until I was 17. I had just received a college scholarship, and after giving a speech about my love for marine life, the owner of Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms, a nearby oyster farm, walked up and asked if I had anything to do that summer. Despite the fact that I had no idea what an oyster was beyond something that produced pearls, I eagerly said yes. Now there are over 300 aquaculture farms in Massachusetts. The one I just so happened to be offered a summer job at was on Cuddy Hunk Island. This is located about 18 miles south from New Bedford. And if you were to leave from the Harvard Museum of Natural History right now, it would be about an hour car ride with an added hour ferry ride. What you would find when you arrived would depend on the season. In winter, you might see a few people and a few Snowden golf carts. But if you were to arrive today, you would experience a true Cuddy Hunk summer. The island has about 500 seasonal cottages for residents and tourists alike. There would be fishers, boaters, and if you're lucky, you might catch a glimpse of an oyster farmer heading out to the west end of the island. Let's check out a video of what this ride to the west end looks like. We ride golf carts everywhere. There are very few paved roads and there's beautiful views of the ocean and some grasslands. The ride to the west end of the island takes about 30 minutes. It's pretty bumpy, but when you get there, there's a beautiful view of the west end pond. Now, so that we have virtually arrived at the west end of the island, which is um, marked here with the red pin on the map, you should know that on the west end of the island is a 30 acre saltwater pond. And within this pond live 400,000 Eastern oysters, scientific name, Crassostria virginica. Here's a video of the oyster farm from the shore. Yes, very glorious. So now that you've seen the shore aspect of the farm, let's actually head to the water. Take, it the, take a look at the lines with the buoys on them. On each buoy hangs a net with 100 oysters in it. Here is the video of the shore part of the farm. Okay, so we have seen the farm, 
But before we actually begin or virtually farming these oysters, it might be helpful to know what an oyster actually is. An oyster is an animal, specifically a shellfish called a bivalve, meaning it has two shells. Their top shell is flat and their bottom shell is cupped. Within this bottom shell is where the organs of the oyster are. They have gills, just like many other sea creatures you may know of, and these gills help them do two things, breathe and eat. Through these gills, oysters are able to filter oxygen from the water, as well as phytoplankton microscopic marine algae that oysters love to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now they also have a mantle. The mantle is a gooey skin-like layer that covers the inside of their shells. This mantle also helps their shell to develop. The pink tissue in the very middle is called an adductor muscle. And this is what contracts and relaxes to open and close the oyster's shell. This muscle is extremely tough. So to open an oyster, you must cut the adductor muscle. We will get back to this later. Now all oysters begin as free swimming gametes. Oyster reproduction is pretty simple and oysters can reproduce within their first year of life. The warmth of the early summer months triggers younger oysters to release their sperm and consequently the older oysters to release eggs. These sperm and eggs combine in the surrounding water to form a baby oyster. Now this baby oyster is free swimming, but once it has settled onto a substrate, maybe like a rock, we call these oysters spat. It takes one to three years for spat to develop into adult oysters. And it is during this time period when Cuddyhunk Shellfish Farms receives them. Let's head to the farm to check out some of the younger oysters on Cuddy Hunk right now. We also call these young oysters seed. This is sometimes confusing, but just think of the oyster spat as baby, baby oysters, but think of the seed as teenage oysters. Seth Garfield, the owner of Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms, was very kind enough to let me film him explaining the oyster farm just a few weeks ago. Let's begin with Seth explaining the oyster seam seed on Cuddyhunk Shellfish Farms. At least for Cuddyhunk Shellfish Farms in this pond, this 30 acre saltwater pond, we plant our oysters in uh, middle of March to April. We choose to buy one inch to inch and a half, one year old oyster seed from Fishers Island, New York. And then we get them in burlap bags. We bring them from New London, Connecticut to Cuddyhunk. And then we bring a bunch of people together and put them into these nets. So already, here's an example of one of our seed that we bought. And if you hold it up, you can see the growth edge just in the last three weeks of the water temperature being above 48 degrees that these have started to grow. These oysters, so we bought 250,000 oysters this season. 20% of these oysters will be ready for sale by August. And in any population, you have some fast growers and slow growers, but in this group, 20% will be super fast growers, big enough to sell by August. Great, so like Seth mentioned in that video, Cuddy Hunk plants the young oysters in mid-April, and 20% are ready to be sold by the end of November. The rest will be sold throughout the year. When the water temperature drops below 48 degrees Fahrenheit, the oysters remain alive, but they go into hibernation, and they don't grow until the water gets warm again the following spring. Let's head back to the farm and see what happens after we harvest the oysters, after they have already grown. So these nets, I have oysters that have not been touched since November, so they're pretty dirty. And all we do is we dump them out of the Japanese internet. Then we wash them. Pretty cleaner. And then we take them off and run them through the machine. Great. 
So now all the oysters grow at different speeds. So once we harvest the batch, like we just saw Seth do, we can't assume that all the oysters are big enough to sell yet. Let's check out the oyster sorting machine, which makes finding the largest oysters much, much simpler. So this is our oyster sorting machine, which makes our life very easy. Turn on the switch. Rotary motion is just going to size these oysters through the different holes. You can see there's lots of biofouling tuna capes. So we're constantly cleaning the oysters. So we put them into this machine and there's two different sized holes. So the small ones fall out here, the medium size fall out here, and the market oysters will fall out. So just like Seth mentioned in that clip, some of the smaller oysters are not ready to sell yet, so we have to put them back in the pond. We call these carrybacks for that reason. We'll carry them back and they will spend a few more weeks in the pond until they have reached a good size for selling. After the oyster sorter machine has done its job, we take all of the carrybacks, put them back in the three tier nets, and hang them back on the buoy so that they can continue growing. Let's head back to the farm and see this happen. So these are the oysters, we call them carrybacks because we carry them back that are too small to sell. So we put them back in, these are Japanese lander nets, put them back into the vertical water column where they will grow for six to eight more weeks and then we'll reharvest them uh, to get the next batch of oysters out of here. These are a nice dried nets. We sun dry them. most effective way to kill the biofouling. And each line in the in the pond is labeled and we keep track of it so we know what line needs to be harvested next. So now that we have seen the carrybacks, some oysters may be big enough to sell but we may not have anywhere to sell them to yet. These are called keeper oysters. To keep them nice and fresh, they are kept in the surface water in milk crates where they continue to get oxygen. Let's see this happen on Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms. 100 count crates of keeper oysters. Awesome. And they're fresh, ready to go. Great. So now that we have seen the farming process, it's important to know that Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms sells to many different types of buyers. These include restaurants, seafood markets, and private parties all over the East Coast. The oysters are refrigerated during shipping because remember, they are still alive. Here is a video of a typical load of oysters being brought back to the mainland. So, so far we have gone from oyster reproduction to a restaurant, but the fun does not end here. These oysters still need to be opened. Do you remember the adductor muscle I mentioned when we were talking about oyster biology? Well, that muscle is extremely good at keeping the oyster's two shells closed tight. To open the oyster, you must cut the adductor muscle through a process called shucking. Shucking is much easier to understand if you actually watch someone do it. So here's a video of me shucking an oyster just a few days ago. Hi everyone, 
Now we're gonna learn how to open or shuck an oyster. So this is the oyster we're going to shuck today. And you can see I'm wearing two cotton gloves that will protect me from any cuts or scratches I may get while opening the oyster. We also need a knife. I'm gonna use a regular kitchen butter knife, but there are also oyster specific knives. They're a little bit smaller and have curved tops, but a butter knife will do just fine. There are two ways to open an oyster. You can either start from the bottom or you can start from the side. When using a butter knife like this one, it's a little bit easier to start from the side. So that's what we'll be doing today. You wanna start by putting your knife right in the crevice where the two shells of the oyster meet. From there, you wanna wiggle your arm back and forth. This might take a little bit of pressure. You wanna apply pressure and keep wiggling and wiggling and wiggling. Eventually, you will feel the knife go through the shells and then you will feel the abductor muscle. Keep wiggling so that you cut the abductor muscle in half. From there, you'll feel the oyster crack open and you can pull it apart and voila. If you were to serve this oyster on the half shell, you wanna kind of scrape it from the top of the shell. You wanna cut it from the abductor muscle below because it's still attached, right? That abductor muscle was what was keeping the two shells together and it's ready for cocktail sauce. Awesome. So now that you're all expert oyster farmers and have seen them go from spat to food source, it is also important to think of oysters as a form of ecosystem restoration. I mentioned previously that oysters use their gills to filter oxygen and food from the surrounding water. What I didn't mention is that oysters also filter out excess nutrients in the water. These nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus act as major water pollutants if they exist in high quantities in water. Oysters naturally filter out these contaminants and incorporate them in their own bodies in a way that makes them still safe to eat. You can see the two tanks on the screen. One has oysters in them that filter out all the dirty nutrients. But think of veggies that you grow in your garden. These veggies are taking in nitrogen from the soil and still remain edible. Same goes for oysters. Simply, oysters are a natural water filtration system. There are many large water restoration projects happening right now that use oysters as an efficient way to clean the water. One project to have on your radar is the Billion Oyster Project in New York City. A billion oysters are being planted in New York Harbor and what are called oyster reefs. Since the beginning of the project in 2014, they have seen major results. And not only have they seen the water quality getting better, the amount of biodiversity has increased due to the reefs acting as habitat for fish, seaweeds, and other native species. On top of all of this, the Billion Oyster Projects, as well as many other oyster restoration projects, use recycled shells from oysters that have already been eaten to act as surface for spat to attach onto, continuing the cycle of an oyster's life. To conclude, Harvesting and enjoying oysters each summer is a reminder to me of all of the natural cycles occurring in our world each and every day and how warmth in time helps even the crops in the ocean to grow, feed our world, and even restore it. Thank you all for watching and I look forward to your questions about oyster aquaculture. Hi Skyla. Hi Thank Diana, how are you? Good. Thanks for doing the segment um, for us. Um, I actually updated my updated my flower crown just for you. This is one that I made with my nephew's Legos. A um, little different, but I just wanted to to share it uh, because we're inviting everyone who's watching to make their own flower crowns at home. They don't have to be fancy. You just have to have fun doing them. So tell me, how are you doing today? I'm doing so great. I don't have a flower crown, but I'm wearing flowers on my shirt, so I hope that will suffice. Um, but before we get started with the Q&A segment, I just want to give a big shout out to Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms and to Seth, the owner of Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms, who you all met in the previous video. Um, Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms has been raising oysters and educating the next generation of aquaculturalists for 39 years now. And they let me interrupt their very busy schedule to come and film. So um, a big shout out to them. And I think Seth is watching. So hi, Seth. Um, and yeah, with that, I think we can begin the, the Q&A, Diana. Yes. 
Hi, Seth, and thank you so, so much for the videos. They were great. So we're going to take uh, questions from audience uh, members, and we have staff behind the scenes who are going to type those up for us. Um, but I have a few already. The first one, actually, from one of our staff members is, how did you first get involved with oyster farming? Great question. Um, so I, I mentioned a little bit about this in the video, but like I said, I, I grew up in New Bedford, Mass, and shellfishing is a, is a big industry here, but I didn't try my first oyster until I was 17. I was giving this speech about marine life, and I really wanted to be a marine biologist, and just so happens that Seth Garfield, the owner of Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms, was at this, you know, scholarship meeting, and he walked up to me after and he said, hey, you seem like you really like the ocean, you seem like, you know, you're, you're into field work and all of these things. So um, would you like a summer job? And um, I was like, yeah, of course I would like a summer job. Doing what? And he said, working on an oyster farm. And I had no idea what that meant at the time. I was like, Should I, will I be harvesting pearls? What's going on here? Um, but at first I started kind of on the retail side of things. So I was doing shucking and raw bar events. And then it wasn't until the second summer where I was brought to the farm and I was like, oh, this is such an amazing process. I was understanding aquaculture in its fullest form. Um, and from there on, I, I always wanted to be on the farm. You know, I, I love seeing oysters go from seed to restaurant. So yeah, that's kind of how I got started. Thank you for sharing that, Skyla. So we have a question from Meredith. Um, are oysters a food source for other marine life? And specifically, do sharks eat oysters? That is a great question. Um, so I know that on the farm, we have a pesky seagull problem. So seagulls can actually get into oysters as they can with other clams. So right, if you're walking on the beach or on the shore side, you might seem, see some broken shell parts. They might not be oyster parts, but they might be other clams or bivalves. Um, and that's from seagulls. They fly these things up in the air and they drop them down. Sometimes they drop them down from about 60 feet and they can break them open and they can eat what's inside. So similar to oysters, also if the oysters are opening when they're in the water, the seagulls can get inside and eat them. Um, sharks, I have not, I do not know of any sharks that eat oysters. Um, I don't think it would be enough bang for the buck for them that, you know, they're looking for big high protein nutrient sources where oysters they're so small, um, I don't think they would be able to really fill a shark's appetite. Okay, um, another question. Do oysters taste different according to size? Mm, great question. Um, so I think where I'll start here is oyster taste is not necessarily a product of size, but it is a product of environment. So oysters grown in fresh water taste a lot different than oysters grown in salt water, or even our Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms is kind of a mix of the two. We're getting both salt and fresh water because we're a pond that's being kind of flushed over with ocean water every day. So all of those things will contribute to the taste of an oyster. Like some oysters are very briny, kind of taste almost buttery, and some oysters are really salty. So that's just a product of the phytoplankton they're eat eating, and the phytoplankton they're eating is a product of the environment they're in. So saltwater phytoplankton tastes different than freshwater phytoplankton. Um, so that's really where the taste is coming from. I do think it's important to note this about size though, right? So oysters, my favorite way to eat them is raw. Um, and they're up to a certain size. It's really great to eat them raw, but past that, it's kind of like you're eating, okay, a huge booger now, right? Like a really, really big slimy thing. Um, and a lot of people don't, love eating some of the larger oysters raw. So these oysters, maybe they're four or five years old. Um, so this is when you can put them on the grill or you can stew them. Um, and they, it's just a little bit more palatable when you have such large oysters. So going back to the question, it's not necessarily the size that, that gives them a taste, um, but size does dictate how people eat oysters all over the world. Okay, thanks. So, um... I know sometimes people worry about whether an oyster that they're having may be bad. How can you tell if something is, is bad? Great question also. So you can tell if an oyster is bad, um, I think three ways. So the first thing to think about is if you're buying oysters, um, you know, from a seafood market, let's say, and you buy a big package of unshucked oysters, right? So their shells are still closed. 
and then you go and you're, you're about to make them for dinner and you notice that the shells are open, that's not always a great sign, right? Because we want to eat the oysters when they're alive. That's when they're the freshest. Um, so if you see an open oyster, one thing you can do is try to pinch it closed. And if they close themselves, that means they're still alive, they're fine to eat. Um, if they don't close themselves though, when you try to pinch an open oyster, that does mean they're dead. And in that case, they're no longer good to eat. Something else you can look for is color. So if you're opening an oyster and you're seeing like a gray, dried, shriveled up piece of meat, that is not necessarily good. You don't wanna eat that type of oyster. Um, you wanna eat an oyster that's you know white and wet and looks like it just came out of the ocean. And then I think the third way to tell is kind of the smell. So now, not oysters don't smell great in general, but there is kind of a baseline that you're looking for. Um, and if your oysters are smelling like rotten eggs, they're just generally not good to eat anymore. That really intense sulfur smell is not what it's supposed to smell like. It's supposed to smell like, you know, a nice gentle ocean breeze, okay? Not necessarily like sulfur and rotten eggs. <laughs> well, I, I am definitely missing that ocean breeze. Um, <laughs> so we have a, another question from an audience member, Amanda. How does the oyster build its shell? Is the mantle a part of this process? Yes, absolutely. So I'm not really sure about the biochemical, you know, compositions of the shell, but the mantle is actually what's contributing some of the calcium and that calcium is building up and layering itself over the years, um, actually pretty quickly, because you think about an oyster of about two inches will grow in, you know, three years. Um, so that's a lot of calcium for the mantle to be secreting. Um, but that's how it happens, just layers and layers and layers and it hardens up in the water and that's how they protect themselves. Okay. Um, another question for you. Can oysters only be grown along the New England coast? Are there oyster farms in California or Florida? All great questions. Um, so oysters are grown all over every coast. Um, they're grown up in Massachusetts. They're grown in the Chesapeake Bay. They're also grown all over the West Coast. Um, there are different species though. So the oysters we're eating over here on the East Coast are probably a different species from those on the West Coast, um, but they're really like a, a global food store. Some of the largest oyster farms are in China, completely different species, um, but still in the, you know, in the oyster grouping and people eat them kind of in different ways all over the world, but still that you can go back to that general like oyster taste, you can eat it raw, you can grill it, despite them being different species that are grown everywhere. So talking about eating oysters, um, when did oysters become a luxury food item? Great question. Um, so I think to answer this question, maybe let's, let's go back in chronological order about, you know, just oyster eating in general. Let's think about the history of oyster eating. So let's think of Greek and Roman times. This is when oysters were really popularized as a delicacy, um, you know, the, the high class people in these Greek and Roman societies were eating oysters. Um, and you know, there's the story of Aphrodite and that's where the aphrodisiac comes in. So Greek and Roman times, oysters are a big, big delicacy. And then we move into more of like the 18th and 19th century. This is called the golden age of oysters. And people say it's the golden age for a multitude of reasons. Basically there's the populations are doing really well. Um, they're being popularized all over the world. They're being harvested at unscaled levels. Um, and in this time they become just, you know, a common person's food source, right? And this, this trend continues into the early, early 20th century. So now they're a little cheaper. People all over the world want to eat them. And when we get into the 20th century, we're getting refrigeration, we're getting railroads. So now these oysters that used to only be eaten by people, you know, on the coast, these oysters can get, can get into the mainland and into the inlands. Um, but with this comes a major downfall of the population. So now they're being over harvested to get oysters out to Kansas and, you know, middle China, places like that. So as they're being over harvested in the 20th century, they see a huge downfall. There's also, I think, some oyster diseases that come into play here because as they're being over harvested, you know, people want more and more oysters. So they're bringing in oysters from places they weren't 
originally. So, right, like I said before, there's species on the West Coast that aren't necessarily found on the East Coast, but they're being transported everywhere now because everyone wants to start growing them. So when you're bringing in these species that aren't necessarily from this native area, they can be called invasive species. They can bring in a bunch of different diseases into these oyster populations. So when we're getting into the 20th century, we see a bit of a downfall because of the diseases, because of the over harvesting. Um, and this is when oysters become, you know, very expensive, hard to find again. But coming into the 21st century, oyster populations are really rebounding. Um, and I think they're becoming more and more common every day. Okay, uh, a question from audience member Jan. Are you seeing evidence in oyster farms that ocean acidification from climate change is affecting their growth? Mm, so there is really no evidence of that on the pond that I work on, on the oyster pond that I work on. Um, we're actually seeing really the positive effects of, of oyster farm, you know, cleaning the water and everything like that. Um, but something to take into consideration is oysters are, are really variable. Their, their success can depend on temperature. So ocean acidification, you know, it's, it's paralleled with ocean warming um, and not all oysters do great in really, really warm temperatures. Um, basically 48 degrees Fahrenheit and below they're hibernating and above that they're, they're eating, they're living, they're, they're spawning and everything. Um, but if it's too hot, that's also not great for them. So we're seeing there's, I can imagine we're seeing declines in oyster populations due to that. Um, and on top of just declines, we're seeing oysters in places that maybe they weren't before. And like I said, different species. So Northern species are now moving South because water temperatures are changing, conditions are changing, things like that. Um, so although I haven't seen any real negative effects on the pond I work at, I can imagine just the future of oyster farming is going to be a lot different. And the, the places that are growing oyster farms are gonna definitely gonna have to account for acidification and warming and things like that. Okay. Um, are there projects in Massachusetts like New York City's Billion Oyster Project? Mm, great question. So I don't know of any of that scale. Um, I actually did a project last semester looking into what if we planted oysters in the Charles River, like what would happen? Um, kind of an interesting thing to think about. So I don't, but I don't know of any right now. I can say though that just in Cuddyhunk Shellfish Pond alone, and right, this is an oyster farm. The oysters weren't put there to restore the pond in any way, but there were some, you know, there were some pollutants and nutrients existing in the pond just because of human interaction with it before the oyster farm. And now that the oysters are there, they're seeing much like less amounts of nutrients, just a much healthier booming pond. We're seeing species that we've never seen before. Maybe that's because the oysters are acting as substrate. You know, they're acting as kind of like homes and niches that these things can live in and can exist in. Or maybe it's just that the oysters are filtering out these nutrients so that larger fish species and crab species can all return and, you know, make home of this pond again. So although I don't know of any like large restoration projects happening in Massachusetts, I like to think of all of the oyster farms, um, like Cuddy Hunk Shellfish Farms as a sort of restoration project in its own right. Okay, a um, bio related question, biology. Oh. <laughs> this is not a test, Kyla, not to worry. <laughs> Um, are oysters related to clams and mussels? Oh, great question. Okay. Um, so I think I have this right here. They are all under the phylum um, that is mollusks. So mollusks are anything with like a really hard shell or even a hard beak. So like an octopus is a mollusk. Um, and mollusks are include oysters and include clams. But then we go one step further down and oysters and clams, you know, typical shellfish that you're eating are all bivalves. So they're related in that way. They have the two hard shells that can open and close. Scallops also are bivalves. Um, they're opening and closing, they're, they're filtering their food in and out. So I think that's that they're in the same, I think, order that is the, the bivalve order. So that's their relationship there. Okay. <laughs> Yet another biology related question. Uh, pop quiz, quiz number two. <laughs> How do oysters form pearls? A great question. Okay. So I am no oyster, uh, no pearl farmer, but I will, I will give my best shot at this. Oysters, right? They have their two shells. 
And when an irritant gets into their two shells, this irritant, it used to be thought of as sand, like maybe sand gets in their shells. I've learned recently though, that it's more likely a parasite that gets into their shells. Um, and when the oyster feels this parasite within its shell, they're like, oh, that doesn't feel good. What they do is they start secreting oyster saliva, basically it's called knacker. They start secreting it over that irritant, right? So they're layering the irritant. They're covering it up with their own saliva to make it much smoother, um, much less irritable in, in, in their shells. Um, and they secrete layers upon layers of this knacker. And eventually you get a very smooth pearl, you know, a very smooth spherical shape um, that, that, we're, that we know of as oyster pearls. I would like to say though, they don't always come out, you know, perfect, ready for the jewelry store. It depends on the conditions again. In some freshwater ponds, the knacker is a little bit different and the pearl looks more like puffy rice, you know, nothing you would really want to put on a necklace or things like that. Um, but it, it's important to also mention that the pearls you're seeing in stores today are usually farmed. So that's actually an oyster farm of a completely different sphere. That's an oyster farm where they're growing oysters, but they're also placing the irritant in the oyster. So purposely putting the irritant in it, allowing the pearl to develop over about three years and then harvesting the pearls. Um, but I hope that answers, hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes, I, I honestly didn't know how pearls um, formed. Um, so this is more of a personal question. What's your favorite way to eat an oyster? Oh, such a fun question. Um, I definitely prefer eating them raw with a little bit of lemon and some cocktail sauce, but I also recently tried some fried oysters and they were great too. So yeah, raw or fried, probably my favorites. <laughs> Okay, well, we don't have uh, a, a lot of other questions um, or other questions rather. So Skyla, what are you up to this summer? Yeah, so this summer I'm on Cuddyhunk Island, um, the same island where the oyster farm is. And I'm splitting my time between the oyster farm, right? Because oyster farming, I guess, is an essential business. People still want their oysters. Um, large seafood markets, you know, they're still in demand. So I'm splitting my time between the oyster farm, raising the oysters, and also working for a watershed coalition on Cuddy Hunk, which um, ties in perfectly because a lot of the research that this coalition does is looking at water quality and ways to improve water quality and ways to decrease nitrogen levels. So oysters are perfectly tied into that. And I think this summer, I'll be looking into the West End Pond, the pond where we grow our oysters, and comparing that to other ponds where there's no oysters growing, and kind of continuing the research of oysters as this form of ecosystem restoration. So yeah, a very fun summer ahead. <laughs> that sounds exciting. Uh, we hope that you have a great summer. We, we really thank you again for being part of this, this program, especially with sh such short notice. I know that um, it's been a difficult time for, for students um, to be away from school, but uh, we hope that um, we'll all be back yes. eventually, soonish. We don't know, right? But um, I, I haven't met you in person, uh, but it's been wonderful to work with you virtually, and I wish you all the best and look forward to meeting you when you are a senior <laughs> back on campus. Thank you so much, Diane. I look forward to meeting you too. This is really wonderful. All right, Skyla, take good care. All right, have a good day.